All right. Well, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. My name is Christy Offenbacher. I've been working with the Brooklyn Political Education Working Group. Um, this event is also sponsored by the Socialist Fem Feminist Working Group of the DSA. Um, so Medicare for all, single payer. Can you guys say that with me? Medicare for all, single payer, right? Uh, this is our demand as socialists, as small d Democrats, um, as people living in this country. These days, more and more attention is being lavished on this demand. 16 senators co-sponsored Bernie Bill, Bernie's uh, bill, and in the House of Representatives, John Conyers' uh, companion bill reached 120 um, co-sponsors. It's just a program of repeal that would leave millions more without insurance. The right and the center, in other words, both lack a compelling vision and strategy of a way forward. The wind is in our sails, the left sails. Or is it? As recent fights, about one-sixth of the economy. So let's state the obvious. Medicare for all is a revolutionary reform. Agitation and advocacy on its behalf will bring forth the entrenched opposition of big capital, not to mention its paid spokesman. Just turn to the op-ed pages of the New York Times for a small taste. This is a battle, not a summit of te technocrats. This is class war in which there are enemies. Organizations like the DSA, which have made Medicare for All a priority, not only have to name why this is a good idea on paper, they have to think strategically about how to build power in order to achieve it. So this event today is about demystifying the road that lies ahead as we and other organizations on the left make our push for Medicare for All. We have assembled a stellar panel of labor activists, healthcare providers, and policy analysts to discuss and hopefully to, to debate some of the questions around the opposition to this reform. Who stands in the way? How, I, how might we overcome their opposition? Who are our key allies? What levers can we seize to advance our goal? And more fundamentally, why is this a key socialist demand? Um, beyond single-payer insurance um, lies the horizon of truly socialized medicine. What might health justice and a socialist healthcare system look like right here in the United States? Um, so we're very lucky to have as our moderator today, Sarah Leonard. Um, Sarah is, a features ed is the features editor at The Nation and co-editor of The Future We Want, Radical Ideas for a New Century. She's a contributing editor to Dissent and The New Inquiry. She's also a member of DSA's Socialist Feminist Working Group. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here with three really fantastic panelists. Um, we're going to have a good conversation. I'm going to start by introducing them. Uh, everybody's going to make some opening remarks. Uh, Runa has a, a revolutionary PowerPoint, not like a TED Talk PowerPoint. Um, and uh, so we're going to start there because it's going to give us a great overview. We can all get on the same page. And then we have some opening remarks um, following that. I'll ask a few questions. We'll talk for about half an hour, and then we're going to open it up to questions. I know a lot of you are organizing on this topic, think a lot about it, so your questions are going to be the best ones to get us sort of having the conversation we need to have. Um, so to, to introduce our, our panelists here, um, Mark Dudzik is a longtime union activist and worked on an effort to launch a labor-based political party in the 1990s. He's currently the national coordinator of the labor campaign for a single payer. Um, Dr. Runa Ray is a family physician and specialist in HIV, LGBT health, and public health. Uh, she has worked in community health centers in the Bronx and Manhattan and helped unionize her last clinic. She is a board member and fellow of the Metro New York Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program and a founding board member of Public Accountability Initiative, the home of LittleSys.org, a site that helps citizens conduct research on the rich and powerful. She has been an activist on feminist health and labor issues since she was a teenager, and she is a member of DSA. Uh, oops. My phone is also rejecting my efforts here. Um, Tim Faust here to my right, is a single-payer activist with DSA who has been traveling the country talking about Medicare for All and the broader fight for health justice. He is currently an MPA student at NYU and with his partner produces Heavy Medical, a podcast about health policy and metal. Um, 
their book, Health Justice Now, Single Payer and What Comes Next, will be published next year by Melville House. Um, so uh, I don't need to give much more introduction than Christy just gave us, which was awesome. I think it's worth noting that the fact that 60% of Americans are in favor um, of the federal government ensuring health for everybody and 33% are for single payer is certainly a testament to uh, the Bernie campaign, but also to the thousands and thousands of activists who, are, who have been working before and since that campaign to persuade people that this is the right way to go. And that also Americans are feeling a lot of pain around healthcare, but a lot of optimism that we can actually do something about it, which is new. Um, so let's start with Runa here um, and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> Should I sit closer? Yes, this is better. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little congested. Um, my name is Runa Ray. Thank you so much for the kind introductions. Um, excuse me, just to contextualize this a little bit. Um, in New York State, uh, this bill, the, um, the New York Health Act of the single payer bill, has been, um, it was introduced by Dick Gottfried, an assemblyman, uh, in the early 90s. Um, so this, this very specific campaign for single payer has been going on for decades in New York. And, um, and this moment that we're living through right now is a very exciting, hopefully, culmination of, of a decades-long movement. Okay, so, you know, I was uh, given a set of questions, which I think is a really great um, way to organize this panel. So the first one, why, um, why is Medicare for All a key socialist demand? Um, and I think the big picture is that we are trying to um, redefine um, politics, the economy, and our society um, by a uh, language of care. Um, and I think that's why um, Medicare for All is a great place from which to start these new politics. Healthcare is fundamentally a caring labor, <clears throat> um, and caring labor is done uh, both in the formal sector and in the informal sector, predominantly by women. Um, you know, which is why I was very excited to see this campaign taken up and really led by the Socialist Feminist Working Group at DSA. Um, so in, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, putting forward uh, Medicare for All, um, we are trying directly to confront and challenge um, the Trump agenda. Uh, and if you look at the federal budget that Trump puts forward, it's very clearly um, a very different kind of politics. It's a politics of um, toxic masculinity, violence, and based in fear. So what is the Trump agenda trying to put forward? They're trying to put forward um, a budget that supports the military, um, ICE, Homeland Security, police, and the VA, okay? Um, so that's big picture why this is a socialist demand. <clears throat> um, and I think an easy way for people to think about that whoops, um, is to ask this question. Um, how would your life change if you had guaranteed healthcare that met all of your healthcare needs? And I think this is both an important question for us um, in the movement as activists and organizers and a really great way to start conversations with people um, when we're trying to engage them on this topic. Because <clears throat> sometimes health policy can seem really wonky and just really difficult to approach, but everyone understands their own health care um, and has stories about what their engagement has been like with the healthcare care system. Um, and, you know, and this is also a great way to... Um, to start the question of, you know, what does it look like when we live in a society where healthcare is not a human right, which is the society we live in today? Um, healthcare is then used as a bargaining tool, a bargaining chip, and used to coerce us um, in so many other parts of our lives. So, for example, um, employment, our uh, marriage and partnership statuses, our immigration statuses, our disability status, these are all ways um, and places. <clears throat> in which uh, you know, the, the lack of health care as a human right is used as a way to really control people and lose, um, you know, people lose autonomy in their lives. Um, as a more concrete example, um, you know, the majority of women, for example, uh, don't get their health care um, autonomously through, you know, well, I mean, nothing's really autonomous when you get it through your employer, but um, you know, we are all dependent on our, our employment status or our marriage status for example, our disability status, our migration status, 
um, in order to access healthcare. And when, um, you know, healthcare is a basic human need, uh, we need to just be able to access it without respect for um, all these other issues. <clears throat> All right, so um, the next question is, you know, since we are here as a group of activists trying to organize, um, who is the opposition? And the opposition is not, um, it's not rocket science to figure out who the opposition is. The big interests um, are uh, the health insurance companies, big pharma, um, corporate lobbying groups, um, and then I failed to leave on this, put on this slide, think tanks and free market groups, which are all sort of funded by the same people. Um, big moneyed interests. Um, so, I'm going to briefly describe the landscape in New York State um, of who the opposition is very concretely. Um, so in the health insurance world, um, the, this is just looking at a snapshot of 2017. Um, health insurance companies um, lobbying on the New York Health Act <clears throat> just in 2017, which isn't over, um, have spent $750,000. Um, these are their total lobbying expenditures, not specifically on the New York Health Act, I um, apologize. But still, you know, it makes you think about, you know, what are they lobbying about? And this is probably one of the big things, things that they're thinking about. Um, the biggest spenders in New York State are Excellus, um, uh, Anthem, and Cigna. Um, and I have to give um, credit to, um, to LittleSys.org, one of the researchers there, um, helped put some of these slides together. <clears throat> All right, so this is a familiar story at this point um, in our political education. This is the CEO pay at the top um, you know, insurance companies in the state. They all make you know, millions of dollars. $2 million is considered low end here, and $16 million is you know, on the higher end. But you know, at this point, after Occupy Wall Street in 2011, we're pretty familiar with this story. <clears throat> all right, next we have Big Pharma. Um, so uh, the pharmaceutical company, so pharma is actually a lobbying group um, that's a coalition or, um, of the pharmaceutical companies <clears throat> um, nationally, and they have um, you know, local, um, they probably don't call them chapters groups. So pharma represents dozens of pharmaceutical manufacturers. They spent $31,000 um, this year, uh, and their main lobbyist is uh, someone called Cozen O'Connor. It's a firm that it's retained um, specifically to work on the New York Health Act, presumably not to support it. Um, and this is just in the, the you know, first half of 2017. The, the picture on the right, don't like break your eyes trying to figure it out. <clears throat> um, these, I'm gonna show you a bunch of, um, of images uh, that look like this in the next few slides. And these are all, um, these are all built using littlesys.org, which is um, a website that helps people map the power, basically, um, that are, uh, on like issues that they're interested in. So <clears throat> as you can see here on the right, um, there's a whole bunch of pharmaceutical companies and then the middle dot is, um, is pharma uh, and you can see pharma um, gives money to Cozen O'Connor, this like lobbying firm. So we're gonna see a bunch more like this. So corporate lobbying groups. <clears throat> All right, so the corporate lobbying groups in New York State um, the Business Council of New York State is an important one to know about. Um, it's a statewide chamber of commerce. There is 2,500 uh, members from a variety of industries, um, many insurance and pharmaceutical companies. They lobby for Wall Street, <clears throat> um, oil and gas interests, and against workers' rights. Um, and interestingly, many members include many um, public colleges and universities. And I think that's kind of indicative of um, how the market-based system really infiltrates all aspects of our society, including you know, so-called public um, institutions. Um, again, uh, this is a little map showing the Business Council of New York State. Again, don't like um, break your eyes trying to figure out exactly the relationships, but the big picture is, you know, at the top you see a bunch of um, big um, uh, corporations. They all contribute to the Business Council, which is in the center. Um, and then down at the bottom, you see um, a number of public institutions, which also contribute to the Business Council. So, you know, the question is, what does the Business Council do with all this money? Um, so the Business Council uh, of New York State, um, they have governance, count, uh, sorry, these um, insurance and pharmaceutical companies have governance positions on the Business Council. Um, and, and the Business Council is very influential in terms of uh, lobbying at the state level. <clears throat> um, so the next category of opposition is think tanks and free market groups. Um, Reclaim New York, has anyone heard of this group? 
Yeah, so Reclaim New York um, is a, an organization that is funded entirely by uh, the Mercer family. Um, the Mercer family is a wealthy family um, that advances a libertarian agenda. Steve Bannon was a former board member, um, and he may have uh, rejoined after leaving the Trump administration. Um, the Mercer family uh, contributes all of, um, all of the money of Reclaim comes from the Mercer family, which is about $1.25 million in 2015. Um, and they are behind um, the attack ads on the New York Health Act. And I'm sure um, as next January comes and the, the legislature, the legislative session opens up again, we're gonna see more. <clears throat> um, but you can see from these pictures that they're, they're trying to um, really launch a fear-mongering campaign. So I won't get into the details, but um, you know, basically Reclaim New York is really, uh, is connected to a lot of big money influences. Um, and one of those, um, one of the ways that they exert their power is through the Empire Center for Public Policy, which sounds very objective, but it's actually a, um, a think tank that is partially funded by this group of people. Um, and they're putting out a lot of um, news, uh, as you can see in these headlines, that are really trying to, um, really trying to kill this bill that will bring health care to all New Yorkers. So um, as an example, here are some of the um, headlines that they, <clears throat> that they uh, have, have gotten. Um, New York Dems lunatic push for single-payer health care is really trying to discredit us. Mm. So again, what's that? Um, so again, you know, I won't get into the details, but these are all very closely linked with the Mercer family, big money, pharma, etc. Um, so, All right, so this is the juicy part, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we have. Um, <clears throat> how do we confront the opposition? Um, you know, um, I think research is really important, doing this kind of power research, to learn who our targets are and, um, and their allies, and where to focus our efforts. But of course, our real power comes, um, comes in organizing. And um, you know, as I've been very inspired to see DSA doing and other groups doing around the country and around New York, um, the purpose of organizing is to build broad-based support and expand our political imagination about what is possible. Um, the Campaign for New York Health is, um, is really trying to base the organizing that they're doing um, in eliciting people's personal narratives. Um, so, for example, they have a health rights and access survey that they're encouraging people to use in community organizing. It's a very short two-page survey and really meant to um, start conversations around um, you know, people's experiences with healthcare, their obvious dissatisfaction with the healthcare system, and you know, the need for uh, health as a human right in New York. Um, another thing that they're using is um, OnStack, which is a way for people to record short videos about their experiences with healthcare. Um, it's another great organizing tool. <clears throat> um, the, we're also really interested, I think, in partnering with people who've been historically marginalized from healthcare and from healthcare policy, um, and also partnering with movements that are already organizing for, for power in these communities. So as an example, um, uh, the Campaign for New York Health is starting a People of Color and Immigrant Caucus <clears throat> um, to sort of um, s center the organizing um, in these communities with, uh, with a group who's already organizing. Um, you know, <clears throat> there's um, regional, local, workplace, school organizing, community education, people are doing house parties, um, workplace committees. Knock Every Door is a great example of, um, that's an organization that knocks every door they canvas for a variety of issues, um, <laughs> including single-payer health care, and they really came out of the Bernie campaign. Um, similarly, um, neighborhood and individual canvassing, uh, there's a campaign called um, A Thousand Businesses for New York Health um, that are trying to you know, get a thousand businesses to support um, the New York Health Act. Um, there's window signs that you can print out and put in your business. And you know, finally, the point is to keep pressure on elected officials, no matter what their political party affiliation is. <clears throat> um, the Republicans um, have this bill stuck in a committee in the the New York State Senate, um, and so you know, there's a pretty good chance that it might not get out. But we have to keep pressure on you know everyone who's um, who's involved in the state legislature. Um, personally, I like the Midwest Academy Strategies chart as a way to um, help think about how to organize. You can Google it. Um, 
Uh, and then, you know, I think the question that I have for us as a movement is, you know, what would it look like if um, DSA and other organizers on single payer teamed up um, with natural allies, for example, nurses unions, um, the New York State Nurses Association is one of the biggest proponents for this in the state. Um, other examples are Black Lives Matter, um, movements for immigrant justice and reproductive justice and ADAPT, which is a really dynamic uh, disability rights activist organization. Um, so uh, to finish, um, I just wanna um, put this up there as sort of a thought, you know, something to provoke your thinking. Um, on the right is a, um, I don't know if you can see it, it's a, a sign from a, um, a clinic in Independence, Louisiana. I don't know when it's from, but I suspect it's from sometime before the 1960s or, you know, in the, in the 1960s. Um, and as you can see, it's, um, it lists uh, clinic times based by race very explicitly. Um, it, is, it describes the... Um, the racially segregated, explicitly racially segregated um, healthcare system that we had in the U.S. Um, until really the late 1960s. Um, Medicare, when it was instituted in 1966, um, was key in desegregating um, healthcare in the U.S. Um, because hospitals and institutions couldn't get Medicare money um, unless they were desegregated. You know, today, if you look on the right, there is a um, there was a uh, study released earlier this year that demonstrated what we all sort of know um, through our own experience, but that the current healthcare system in New York specifically is segregated both by race and by class. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not quite as explicit as it was, as it is in this um, picture on the left, uh, but it's still there. And, um, and I think one of the questions that we have before us that's I think really exciting as an organizing question is, um, how do we use this movement for um, single payer for all, um, both to advance um, civil rights in the racial justice sense, but also civil rights in so many other senses, um, in terms of gender justice, reproductive justice, immigrant rights. Um, this is really a, you know, an, a, an issue that um, will affect everybody's lives in a wonderful way. Thank you. That was That was fantastic, thank you. Um, and we're gonna turn now to Mark, who is going to speak to, again, what is specifically socialist about this demand and is going to speak to the labor movement's work on single payer specifically. Okay, well thanks. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's really great to be here. Thanks, DSA, for organizing this event. Uh, so we launched the labor campaign for single payer in January of 2009 actually about a week before Obama got inaugurated into his first term. And we launched it then because there was this growing ferment around health care reform. And we wanted to make sure uh, that there was a strong voice for real health care reform emerging out of the labor movement because of these crucial debates that we were entering into. And uh, we basically came together around two central principles. Number one, that health care is a fundamental human right has to be treated as a public good the way we treat education, or we used to treat education, it's not so much anymore. Libraries, firefighting, needs to be decommodified and treated as an absolute public good and an absolute human right. Uh, and then from that, the logic flows that you, you fight for a Medicare for all solution to the, the health care, to decommodify health care. And then secondly, uh, it was around an understanding that the victory in this fight will come not because we have good ideas or we need to do more research or whatever, but victory will come when we build a powerful movement that will confront the concentrated forces of capital that stand between the American people and their health care. And uh, Runa really kind of diagrammed you know, the nature of these forces. Uh, health care is the biggest, most profitable industry in the history of capitalism. And for when you look at health care as a business, there's no real crisis. It's doing quite well as a business. It generates profit and uh, it expands and it grows and it does all the things that business is supposed to do. When you look at it as a public good, it's a gigantic failure. It fails to deliver real health care to real people. So that's sort of uh, the need to do this and that's why we believe that labor is central to this fight because labor at its best exists to confront capital and to take on uh, economic power. Uh, there are three reasons that we kind of talk about as why this is an important issue to labor. You know, we live in this weird world where 
many people, most Americans' health care is linked to employment, and it's just, you know, not, not like that in most of the world, and there's no real good reasons why that should be linked that way, and it's, you know, a long historic uh, reasons why it is so in the United States. But uh, having health care linked to labor and having to have to negotiate health care means, number one, that it's financially unsustainable for the labor movement to continue to do this. Um, it now costs about $26,000 a year for health care for a family of four in this country when you combine all of the costs, uh, employer contributions uh, and the worker contributions and the social contributions for health care. That is for a full time, if someone works full time, that's $13 an hour which is a lot of money if you've ever sat at a bargaining table to think about. Even if you look at what the average employer contributes for family health care, you're looking at $15,000 an hour. These, these amounts go up two, three, four times faster than inflation and average wages have gone up over a, a, a whole period of time, over a 25-year period, and continue to go up that way. And it's just unsustainable to think that we can continue to bargain that kind of money for workers uh, through collective bargaining. We have to find another solution for it. And secondly, it's become politically unsustainable. We see that in particular with public employees, where the right wing has now used the politics of resentment to attack the benefits that uh, uh, public employees have achieved uh, in, ma in many places, especially where they have strong unions. So, you know, they'll, they'll go to the public and say, you know, look at those school teachers. They don't pay a dime for their health care, and you have to pay all this money every month for years. Why should your tax money go to pay for these spoiled teachers or spoiled uh, garbage collectors or whoever? And they attack, they use the politics of resentment to undermine uh, the health care of those who have fought and won decent health care, often at the sacrifice of wages and other benefits. And they also use it to undermine the very notion of unionism and collective power. Uh, among all working people. So uh, it's an uh, issue that undermines those very issues. And then finally, uh, we think that this is a cornerstone of revitalizing uh, uh, the institutional labor movement in this country to make it more um, uh, seen as a uh, movement that speaks on behalf of the entire working class and not have it perceived as just uh, protecting the interests of a narrow group of workers who have already achieved certain benefits. So if we are seen as out uh, leading the fight for health care for all, it kind of changes the nature of what, who we are as a labor movement, just like talking about raising uh, wages to $15 an hour changes how labor tries to organize and approach uh, working class uh, organization and working class politics. So we see it as, as one of those issues that can sort of internally uh, re, re uh, allocate the resources and the vision of the labor movement. Uh, so, you know, we just, we say that the time has come to take health care off the bargaining table by making it a right uh, for everybody in America. Uh, and, you know, we also joke that, you know, we need to, our job as a labor campaign is to move the labor movement beyond resolutionary politics. Uh, almost every union in the country at one time or another has passed a, a resolution saying that they're in favor of Medicare for all or they're endorsing a specific piece of health care legislation. What they mostly haven't done is allocate resources and organizing capacity to this fight to the level that they would if they felt that this was an existential uh, part of uh, their, their work as unions. And there, there are a few unions, mostly nurses unions, who have sort of internalized those issues and became, they've become part of their identity as a union and they really have moved in that direction. So we're trying to look for best practices to move unions forward uh, uh, on that. We just uh, had a very successful intervention in the AFL-CIO convention last month. The, the national AFL meets every four, every four years. Um, we've been trying to push the Federation first to endorse uh, Medicare for All, which they had throughout their history until the early 1990s when there was a huge debate uh, and by a very small majority the Federation aligned with the Clinton health care plan and put uh, Medicare for All as a, a goal on the, uh, uh, on, the ta on the shelf, put it aside. Uh, and we turned that kind of ship around in 2009 and got the Federation to recommit to Medicare for All as a goal. And our 
push since then has been to get them to engage in concrete uh, activities to actually support that. So we came to that convention with some resolutions, uh, organized a group of, uh, of 18 national unions, state federations, and central labor councils to submit identical resolutions and organize a floor debate. And I think we, you know, was very successful both in, in terms of moving the AFL forward and also pulling together a force within the labor movement that's begun to work collectively and assertively around these issues within the labor movement. So for socialists, just like for labor, I think that this is a very important issue for socialists. Uh, um, this is what theoreticians might call a non-reformist reform. This is an issue that confronts capital in a very direct way, undermines the power of capital in a, in a massive way. And uh, in winning this fight, you need to build the kind of movement to take on capital and to build political power for working people that will lead to victories in a whole series of other areas. Uh, we see this today because this has become a wedge issue for the entire resistance to Trump and all that uh, Trump represents. If you look at all of these different groups that are organizing, some very self-consciously, like DSA, who has sort of a theoretical understanding of what you're doing, and then others are just you know community organizations, some of these groups that sprouted out of the indivisible efforts and stuff. They're, you know, healthcare is a unifying issue, and people on their own in many cases have come to the conclusion that they don't want to just circle the wagons around uh, this piece of crap healthcare system that we have today, they really want healthcare for all. They want Medicare for all. And so they're going to town hall meetings, you know, confronting not only Trump Republicans who want to repeal all forms of public health care, but they're confronting Democratic politicians. And, uh, you know, when they stand up and say, I support the Affordable Health Care Act, people are spontaneously say, well, what about Medicare for all? What are you doing about that? And they're pushing from, from below, and it's really become an, uh, a wedge issue. Uh, and finally, I think it's important for socialists to understand this issue as a um, transitional demand. Medicare for all is a necessary but not sufficient um, requirement to win health care justice. It kind of opens up the opportunity to think about health care in a new way, in a decommodified way. Uh, it doesn't directly impact all of the racial disparities in our health care system, all of the, the focus on um, disease rather than health and prevention. So, you know, there, there needs to be, this needs to be seen as, you know, the first step in a long pro project of revolutionizing health to make it into a just health care system that is concerned with the real health of of real people, and so I think socialists ought to begin, as we, we begin to move forward, we, socialists in particular ought to begin to think about, you know, what the, the, the full picture of what a healthcare system ought to look like and how we can begin to, uh, to get there. So this is a real crucial moment. I think we've kind of seized the terms of debate in many ways. Uh, there was a reason why when Senator Sanders submitted his Medicare for All bill in September, he was surrounded by 16 other Democratic senators, uh, including several who have, uh, are likely candidates for president in 2020. And it wasn't because the Holy Spirit had descended on those senators and they had suddenly seen the light about health care justice. It was because they have begun to understand that to run for president in the Democratic Party in 2020, you are going to need to support, at least by words, Medicare for all as a goal that the Democratic Party supports. And this is a sea change. I mean, a year ago, a little over a year ago, we were fighting at the Democratic Convention to include a Medicare for all platform in the Democratic Party platform, and we lost. Uh, and uh, the, the Democratic candidate for president a little over a year ago, as you may recall, was running around the country telling people, you'll never ever have single payer in this country, so you might as well just accept it and get down to making the best with what you have. But I would li just like in union organizing, uh, this is, while we've sort of changed the terms of debate, this is kind of like that point in a union organizing drive right before the boss finds out that there's a drive going on. So everybody's like unifying and they're all, you know, excited about the campaign and everything else, but they have not yet confronted the full force 
of the opposition that's going to be coming down the pike. And believe me, this is going to be a massive, uh, massive opposition because of the economic uh, forces that, uh, that Rona just diagrammed. Um, so we have to start to get ready. This is a point where we need to organize to get ready for this, this assault. In union organizing, we call this inoculation. You need to go to people and get them to understand what the boss is going to say about the union uh, before the boss says it, so that it loses its force and it loses its any impact, so that when the boss says it, it's like, oh, yeah, we expected that. You know, What else you got? And you begin to move forward from that. So this is really the, this is the moment when we can begin to do that and that we also need to understand what we need to do to scale this fight up to, so, to, so that it reaches the potential of really uh, uh, moving towards victory. Uh, you know, this is not going to be done by holding bake sales. You're not going to defeat the medical industrial complex. I mean, holding bake sales is a good thing to do, but it's not, so it's not what we need it to do to win. We need to raise, you know, significant amounts of money and significant amounts of resources. So uh, we need to understand that. New York, I think, has wonderful opportunities to move forward. The politics have really come together in New York State. Um, uh, we're working with the labor movement in New York to try to, uh, to do outreach with labor to support the New York health bill. Uh, I think that's really a, an exciting moment to kind of think about and strategize here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to turn it over to Tim, who has been, I believe, traveling all over um, as a socialist activist. And so you're going to talk a little bit, I believe, about um, making this pitch from a specifically socialist perspective um, and talk about some of the opposition from where you sit. Yeah, hell yeah. Can you all hear me or see me, something kind of like that? I have been all around. I'm going to use the, hold the mic like this because I have a I weird angle. I feel like angle. we need like a metal intro for you. Oh, uh, <laughs> someone just pick up a guitar and throw it at the ground. That's yeah. pretty good. Um, hi. It's good to see everybody. Thank you all for having me. Thank you to the DSA Social Times Working Group. Thank you to Mark and Runa and Sarah. This is a lot of fun. I've been traveling around the U.S. talking about single payer to other DSA chapters, trying to encourage them to canvas, trying to encourage them to organize and take on this fight. And last Thursday, I was in Boston for a triple header. And while certainly uh, misusing the name of God uh, in the middle of a church, lost my voice. So if I seem a little bit scratchy or if I squeak like I was 13 again, please forgive me. Uh, usually I sound way more gruff uh, uh, than, than, than I do right now. But uh, I, I, I've taken kind of a, my stump speech, what I've been saying on the road, and adapted it to a shorter format to talk with uh, for all y'all. So I want to talk about uh, uh, where we're at now with healthcare in America and who it benefits and what we want instead. I want to tell you why we're told we can't have single payer, what we got to accept in its place and why that's horseshit and what we need to do to realize health justice in America. That sound good? That are palatable to all y'all? Yeah. Fantastic. Here's what we got right now. We have created a world in which the costs of receiving health care are much, much more than any individual person can afford by themselves. But in a given year, not a lot of folks need to use health care. In, in a single year, 50% of all costs come from 5% of the population. 80% of all costs come from 20% of the population. And that's a fungible population, right? Maybe one year you get hit by a car or have a premature pregnancy or a cancer scare. The next year you don't. So costs shift around from person to person. But when costs hit you, they hit you pretty hard. So if we made everyone pay for their own medical costs, eventually millions of folks would go into crushing debt, medical bankruptcy. Well, that's not a guess. The primary way of funding healthcare costs used to be out-of-pocket expenditures. And it wasn't until the 1880s when a bunch of socialists and a bunch of unionists insisted that letting people go into medical bankruptcy and crushing lifelong debt and poverty because of sickness wasn't like acceptable. But we shifted to a new payer model, the idea of insurance. Now, insurers are companies or organizations that receive revenue by charging you monthly premiums. When somebody gets sick, insurers spend the money they collect from everybody to pay a portion of those health care costs, plus keep a profit from themselves. So the more revenue uh, uh, an insurer receives from customers, or realistically, the more subsidy it receives from public money, the wider those costs are spread, right? The healthier the risk pool, and the lower the insurer's per person costs. But if an insurer has too many sick people or too many expensive sick people, its per-person costs increase. 
And so therefore, its premiums increase to, uh, to, to keep pace. But when premiums go up, people can't afford it, so they drop out. The people that, re- that, that are already sick stay on board, so per person costs keep going up. So premiums keep going up. It builds this big, stupid, vicious cycle. So thus, an insurer wants as large and as healthy a customer base as possible. Or it wants to find ways to kick out sick customers or coerce them into leaving. That's what we mean when we say we live in a world in which healthcare is a commodity. Right, because futures on your heart and futures on your lungs and your chance of getting diabetes and whether or not your Mima's glaucoma gets better or worse before age 65 because she goes on Medicare are bought and sold for profit by private companies. And this fragmented, commodified healthcare model views healthcare as a transaction that only happens when you're insured instead of a relationship between a person, their body, and their doctors. That's perverted. We've mistaken the profit motives of insurers for healthcare. And over time, we've delegated the responsibility of providing insurance to employers. But that's fucked up, too, because that results in a status quo of total employer domination in which your access to things like contraception or blood transfusions or hormone therapies or the cost at which you, must, uh, uh, you, you pay to, to access them are determined by the whims of your employer. And so every single year, like Mark said, Labor unions are forced to fight corporations for worse and more expensive insurance instead of being free to organize around better wages, better contracts, and workplace safety. But if you aren't lucky enough to have an employer, right, if you lack the better skills to get the finite number of better jobs, you're left behind. And so the people that have profit from the commodification of our bodies have determined it is acceptable to shackle the well-being of children to whether or not their parents are lucky enough to have gone back in time 40 years, learned to code, and found a benevolent employer. Welcome to the hell world that is America 2017. Uh, uh, but, 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 oh, I'm not, it sucks, I don't, don't applaud for that. Uh, um, <laughs> And of course, because this is the beginning of a speech, it must get worse. And it does get worse because the costs of health care keep increasing. And they increase much, much faster than inflation. Now, this scares the bejesus out of everybody involved, right? Particularly the payers. Payers are interested in finding ways to mitigate rising costs. Sometimes that means refusing to pay for claims. You've all heard those horror stories. Maybe it's happened to you or somebody that you love. Before the Affordable Care Act, it often meant that payers would refuse to cover people who were or who were likely to get sick. You all know the phrase preexisting conditions. But this still wasn't driving costs down. So we, everybody in America, got together in the 70s and invented the idea of consumer-driven health care. It's the idea that you should make consumers, which is just a libertarian way of saying people, pay more for the costs of their own health care, right? Because that'll turn them into smart shoppers somehow, and through the power of the free market or whatever, they'll shop around and not get unnecessary care or not get too expensive care or find the cheapest ER if they get hit by a car or, like, yelp their surgeon, and all of this together will drive prices down. But all this builds an atomized, isolationist, and honestly pretty lonely worldview of what health care is, right? And what health care can or should be. It treats being sick or being poor, or being able to get pregnant as a character flaw. And that means if you get hit by a car, or you give birth to a premature baby, or you get rabies, you're on the hook for your own costs, because it's your responsibility. Because healthcare is a matter of personal accountability. And if that accident, or if that illness, or if that pregnancy forces you into a lifetime of crushing debt or medical bankruptcy so that a hospital, a pharmaceutical company, close personal friend Martin Shkreli, or your insurer can turn a profit, well, tough shit, that's the breaks. Consumer-driven healthcare only serves the people who seek to extract profit from our bodies. So what do you do, right? How do you, how do you square the rampant and uncontrollable increase in healthcare costs with the fact that, fundamentally, insuring sick people just isn't profitable? Well, if you're the Democrats, you collaborate with the Heritage Foundation to offer us the Affordable Care Act, which is, at its core, the massive subsidization of private industry with public money. It is a bargain. It is a plaintive wail. Please, 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 pretty, pretty, please, how many billions of dollars do we got to give you so you stop kicking sick people off their insurance plans? 
Now, the ACA, of course, had some unquestioned successes. First and foremost among them, the expansion of Medicaid. In counties that chose to expand Medicaid, we saw a 5.1% reduction in the mortality rate, 11.1% among communities of color. Now, the reasons for that, we understand, right? These are people that have had systematic violence perpetuated against them for centuries. And so even the relatively meager expansion of Medicaid, the uh, offer of a little bit of support has a dramatic impact immediately on people's health outcomes and their ability to lead a healthy life and their relationship and the safety in their own body, but it's not enough because at the end of the day, costs keep increasing, quality of care stagnates for the most vulnerable among us, and 28 million people are still uninsured. The Affordable Care Act has failed in its pursuit of health justice. The Rube Goldberg machine of American health care is going to fail. And when it fails, it will be remade or it will be replaced. And we must articulate the demands by which that replacement is created. So we demand a federal, universal, single payer. Single payer is a pretty simple concept, right? Instead of having a bunch of uh, uh, insurers with a bunch of fragmented customer bases, each kind of seeking to pass the buck and avoid taking care of unprofitable sick people, insurers changing their drug formularies to encourage people with HIV AIDS to not choose that insurer the next year and hop to another one. We have one publicly owned, publicly funded insurer with a legislated mandate to cover in full all care for all people. Now that phrase, all care for all people, is important. We don't want a simple extension of Medicare for all. We want a fundamental remodeling. We want to merge parts A, B, and D into one program. Medicare Part C, which is just legalized graft by the private sector, should be thrown into the dustbin of history. We want comprehensive coverage for all people in America, including all forms of long-term care. We want that to be free at the point of service with no cost sharing. When Medicare was first debated, the American Medical Association, those fucking snakes, fought against it by insisting that letting the government into the patient-provider relationship, that sacred relationship, would amount to total hell. So instead, we handed it to private payers. And now the question of who's paying for this care dominates that relationship completely. Under a single-payer system, the question of who's paying for it is answered. It's Medicare. We preserve and protect the provider-patient relationship by eliminating the question of how can the patient afford this and therefore what do they deserve to receive? Because everybody benefits when accessing care is affordable and easy. Delivering care, being a provider, being a nurse, being a physician, being a therapist, that shit's hump complicated. Bodies are big bags of spectral goo we barely understand and relieving their pain is complicated as hell, but paying for it isn't. Paying for health care is simple. And in fact, we're already paying for it. We're just forced to spend that money really, really stupidly. American public money pays for two-thirds of all health care costs in America. A little half than, uh, uh, of that two-thirds, a.k.a. one-third, is direct spending on Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA. Other half of that two-thirds, a.k.a. the second third, is government subsidies to private companies. And the remaining third is out-of-pocket costs, an additional tax you pay to insurers in the form of premiums, deductibles, and co-pays. And so the goal is not necessarily to reduce this gross level of spending, although any, under any sensible single-payer plan, your out-of-pocket costs as an individual plummet. I think uh, under Sanders' bill, it's projected that a family of four making 40 k a year goes from paying 5300 in uh, annual out-of-pocket costs to 470 But to reallocate this gross spending under uh, a, a monopsony, under a single-payer, to take care of everyone long-term. We know that Medicare negotiates much fairer prices for treatment because it bargains on behalf of 44 million people nationwide instead of a few hundo thundo in a given state or a few 10,000 in a given city or county. So you scale that idea up. By negotiating on behalf of 300 million people, Medicare can demand fair prices for care and develop the payment models necessary to incentivize good behavior from providers. But even before that happens, we free up all the money associated with administrative costs and profit-seeking within the private insurance market. This optimization, this innovation, in their terms, opens up in a conservative estimate an additional $370 billion a year. That's a big fucking chunk of change. So what do we do with the money saved? 
We use it to improve everyone's standard of living. <coughs> we reopen primary care centers in rural areas. We fund community health centers in poor neighborhoods. We hire the army of social workers and patient advocates required to work against the cognitive biases and the racial bigotries inherent in the provision of care. And most importantly, we return that money to the people who do the work. Take, for example, uh, home health aides. Y'all know home health aides? Ever have like a, a, a sick parent or a sick sibling or a sick kid? Uh, you can receive care in a hospital at the rate of $10,000 a night, or you can receive care at home, where your dog lives, where your computer lives. Home health aides are billed that an average of $153 per night, so it's much, much cheaper. Everybody benefits. Except, of course, for the home health aides themselves. Because right now, there'll be 1.2 million of them by the year 2020. They're billed at 153 per visit, but they're paid an average of $11 an hour. So we can allocate this money to do what the private market won't, which is pay fair wages for essential care that helps everyone. Right now, your private insurer only bears the cost of you receiving care right now from that private insurer. Because you're likely to change insurers in the future and eventually go on Medicare, they don't actually feel pressure to provide you with care that keeps you healthy in the distant or even near-term future. Instead, we all do, because we all suffer when our friends and family get sick and public money is allocated to care for folks in times of crisis or catastrophe. So it makes perfect sense that the same actor who suffers when people don't get care, which is all of us, united, represented by our federal government, should also be the actor that pays for that care in the first place. Because once we force the federal actor to bear the costs of providing care and the risks and costs of not providing care, it can find be used as a tool for realizing health justice. If your people are getting sick and dying because they don't have a place to live or the places that live are unsafe, they're full of pollution, they're full of mold, they're flammable, I'm thinking of Ghost Ship in Oakland, I'm thinking of the Grenfell Towers in the UK, then housing is health care. And you are forced to build safe and affordable housing to bring health care costs down. If people are getting sick and dying because they don't have access to healthy food to eat because it's not profitable to sell a poor neighborhood vegetables and so they're getting diabetes and comorbidities like cardiac failure, then food is health care. And you provide all people with affordable or free food options and the time, space, and materials with which to prepare it to bring health care costs down. If your population is getting sick and dying because they don't have access to needle exchange programs, therapy, or counseling, then rehabilitation is health care. And I don't mean our bullshit end-of-life palliative care rehabilitation, but the full social structures required to help folks handle addiction or perhaps not pursue it in the first place to bring health care costs down. Because single-payer is not the goal. Single-payer is only the tool. Health Justice is the goal, and when we fight for health justice, we all fight side by side because economic justice is health justice. Environmental justice is health justice. Reproductive justice is health justice. And justice for black lives, justice for trans lives, justice for the lives of immigrants, and the well-being of all people, regardless of age, gender, race, or creed, that's health justice. We must build the popular movement which begins by demanding single payer from our government and then continues to demand health justice in our nation. And when people tell us we're bringing about creeping socialism, that we're rejecting the American capitalist way of life, we say, yeah, fucking duh, and we keep on fighting. We have inherited a world in which your permission to receive health care, capital's allowance, you can be safe in your own body, is dependent upon how much a profit an insurer can extract from you. When people are in need, we waste time, effort, and money means testing, separating the worthy from the unworthy among those who need help and then stigmatizing them instead of guaranteeing the basic decency of health equity. And for systematically marginalized people, sick people, homeless people, people struggling with addiction, people with disabilities, poor people, pregnant people, trans people, women, and people of color, when there is no way for the medical industrial complex to find value in their bodies, then there is always the private prison system ready to receive them for profit. My friends, single payer is moral. Single payer is necessary. And single payer is achievable. Solidarity now, solidarity forever. Solidarity, y'all.
Now, I feel like instead of com continuing this conversation, everyone should go Canvas right now <laughs> while they're amped instead of continuing to discuss uh, logistics up here. Nonetheless, since you're here, um, <laughs> we're going to keep rolling. And what I want to do is talk about, um, we've had a number of these state level fights for single payer. Um, in, very impressive, New York, California, elsewhere, but still unsuccessful. I think we've learned a lot from those fights, and those fights are ongoing and did not start yesterday, as Runa pointed out. Um, so what I want to talk about next is what some of the lessons are that we can take away from those state-level fights over the last year, um, both in terms of coalition building and in terms of who the opposition is um, and where the critical points of pushback have been. Um, and then I want you also to address how that relates to the national fight. When we talk about single payer, we think about, we think about it on a federal level often. Um, there's a new Bernie bill, which everyone running for president has felt compelled to jump on board with, which is nice. Um, the Conyers bill has been in the House for a long time. Um, so I want to talk about lessons from the state level fights, um, and I want to talk about how we relate that to the national fight and scaling this up. Um, Runa, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I mean, I think <clears throat> with respect to the, um, the, the question of how do these state level fights um, fit into the national picture, I think we're in friendly competition with um, certainly California and uh, the nation to win single payer. Um, I, I don't think there's any harm in having all these concurrent um, campaigns going on. In fact, I think they're, they're great. Um, in terms of state as laboratory, um, you know, I, th the, in, I think in public policy world, like people often think of states as <clears throat> laboratories for um, national change. And with healthcare specifically, um, we've seen precedent set because um, the ACA as it currently exists uh, came out of um, Romney Care, which was piloted in uh, Massachusetts, actually, when I was a medical student there about 10 years ago. Um, so I saw, um, while I was a medical student, Romney Care roll out, and then, you know, a few years later when I became a resident <coughs> in New York, um, the ACA. So anyway, I think that, um, I think it's an exciting time in terms of um, both state and national level politics, and I think New York is definitely the closest um, of the state campaigns to winning. <coughs> we, um, Governor Cuomo, unexpectedly, about a month ago, came out in support of single payer, possibly related to his interest in running for, for president. No. no, he's just, he's a progressive. Oh, right, I forgot. No. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, we, <clears throat> there's only one senator standing um, in between um, us uh, uh, achieving a majority in the, in the New York State Senate, um, and so only public pressure is going to push both push um, change at the state level in terms of you know who's voting in the legislature, but also um, you know keep the pressure on when um, you know these people win. You know, let's say Andrew Cuomo or any of those 17 uh, Democratic senators, when one of them becomes president in 2020, um, there you know I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got weak need you know about about actually enacting single payer um, as they will campaign on. Um, so it's all about building pressure here in the states. Um, very locally. Yeah, so w we think that the state campaigns can give, can spark and uh, help define the, the national fight, that ultimately we have to win this as a national, uh, national right, that states, state systems create all kinds of instabilities long term. But, you know, if you look at the political landscape, uh, and, you, you know, there's nothing that's going to happen uh, concretely in Washington, D.C. for several years, and there's a number of movements going on in the states that are really important, and we can learn a lot from them. So real quickly, um, we look at, you look at a state like Vermont, which actually passed a single-payer bill called Green Mountain Care, which is actually still on the books in Vermont, uh, passed it uh, five years ago now, I think. Um, and, you know, the problem in Vermont was that there's a very long transition period where the governor at one point needed to make a series of recommendations about how to pay for the system. Now, that had not been defined in the original legislation. Uh, and they, the enemies uh, took that period as a, the 
The supporters thought that we had already won, and the enemies took that period as a time to overturn it and uh, organized a counter-revolution in the state of Vermont. And they attacked it specifically around the question of how to pay for single payer, because it is damn expensive to pay for health care. Um, you know, they said it would be the biggest tax increase in the history of the state of Vermont, and they were right. You know, you're basically moving a whole series of fragmented private insurance programs into one big social insurance program, and you collect that social insurance premium through taxes. So, it, you know, because that's where they were most vulnerable, that's where they were attacked. Uh, California is very interesting. Um, they passed a single payer bill through the uh, state senate last session, SB 562, sent it to the assembly where the Democratic chair of the assembly um, bottled it up in a, this committee that meant that it would not uh, come out of committee in the first half of the session. And now they're in the second half. Uh, they just reconvened. And there's a big fight going on in California. What's interesting in California is you have a Democratic governor who had historically been very supportive of single payer. Uh, when Jerry Brown ran for president in 90, was that 92 or 88? Anyway, he said he, you know, that was part of his position. He supported Medicare for all. You have super majorities of Democrats in both the Senate and the Assembly, uh, but it's bottled up in the Assembly. And so the, the fundamental opposition in California is with the Democratic establishment in California, which has its own ties to the medical industrial complex. And that's creating tensions within the movement that we need to build to win single payer in California. Many of the organizations that are nominally supportive are really reluctant to go to war with the democratic establishment, particularly a lot of labor organizations because of their connections around other issues or opportunism or a lot of other factors. So there's a real fight going on right now within the movement in California about how to proceed and how to move forward uh, against this kind of opposition. Some of it is very technical about you know how to move it through committees and whether you do this kind of financing pro proposal or this kind, uh, but some of it is really a question of are you prepared to really break with these kind of uh, uh, politics that ultimately are uh, tied to the sort of corporate uh, power in this society uh, in order to win these fights, and that's really the challenge that they're facing in California. I would s submit, Runa, that we're not as close in New York as as the politics looks like, even though there's only one vote away in the U.S. in the state Senate, I think the kind of challenges that we see in these other states, the closer we get to, to winning in New York, the bigger those fights are going to be. And mm -hmm. we have to be a lot more prepared than we are right now for that. I am of two uh, uh, oppositional minds at the same time about state-based movements. So bear with me as we go on this adventure together. Um, one, with the possible exceptions of California and New York, nice to be in New York, um, states are not equipped, states are not adequately prepared to handle the question of healthcare costs. State-based single payer is fundamentally, uh, uh, in almost every state, with the possible exceptions of, of, of here in California, not sustainable. In uh, the big, bold reason, healthcare costs increased 9% year over year, uh, state, uh, uh, state revenues through taxation are nowhere near that federal level, somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Um, and the revenue available to a given state, the things that can tax, income it can generate, isn't enough to, to, to cross that delta. It leads to a secondary problem. Um, the primary way a state can fund a health care program is through income tax or through payroll, payroll tax. But health care spending is counter-cyclical. That is, when folks lose their job, they need more health care because losing your job is stressful. And so you build a structure, I can't move my hand because I have a mic and a cord, where when people have the least, when the least amount of income is coming in, because people are working, you have the greatest amount of health care costs. And so the state, which cannot deficit spend because they all passed uh, balanced budget amendments back in the 80s, which is the big difference between state-based single payer in the U.S. and Canada, where this wasn't a problem, they have to gut some other kind of program, uh, which means they have to gut education, or they have to gut roads, they have to gut the healthcare program, which is not a great cycle to be in. That's why, that's one of the reasons that the snake of a governor in Vermont gutted Act 48. At the same time, on the federal level, you don't face those same kinds of restrictions. Um, one, there's a bunch of shit we can pull from. The F-35, the plane that can fly, the sea was the gun that can't shoot, the massive imperial failures in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but also, like, on the federal level, money is much less real. Deficits are much less scary. Even noted progressives like Alan Greenspan have noted that if Social Security were ever in crisis, we could just spend into the deficit to take care of it. Like, there's that problem, that constraint isn't levied at the federal level like it is at the state level. 
But at the same time, state-based movements are a fantastic thing to organize around. I believe you can build a transferable constituency, right? Like, one of the problems uh, uh, in other kinds of movements is that you uh, organize around a short-term goal, and if that fails, so does the movement. I think articulating the arc of what we want in the sense of health, well, full socialism, uh, and then communism, uh, uh, um, <laughs> health justice, and we, we want health justice. We believe the means by which we can attempt to realize that is uh, uh, federal single payer, and we believe that like anything which makes federal single payer more likely, uh, while still providing care for more people, protecting material relief, is an adequate goal. I think that's, that's fine to organize around. So therefore, because the New York Health Act could, in theory, work, I think organizing around it makes a lot of sense. But in other states, I get the question of, well, what do we organize for? In Vermont, they've chosen to organize around a state-based universal primary care bill, which provides a lot of relief for a lot of people, is probably pretty expensive, but is much less expensive than uh, uh, funding a lot of the catastrophic and, 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 and chronic care for people, but does provide uh, uh, more relief now. I think you find, you look at the history of healthcare activism in America, when a group of people is given, like, when they're treated like fucking people, when they're given the dignity of being safe in their own bodies, they fight like hell to protect and preserve and to expand uh, that access and that right. I think a great example from this year is ADAPT. Look at, like, why Graham Cassidy didn't pass. Look at why the BCRA didn't pass. Look at why the AHE didn't pass. It's because fucking ADAPT protesters showed up uh, uh, by the busload, got arrested, went to jail, came back the next day over and over and over again, and it is, like, by their grace that we were not thrust into a more, pro more profound hell world. Uh, I think that understanding that, that it was because uh, 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 that a bunch of uh, adapt protesters were fighting for solidarity with all people localized within uh, Medicaid and long-term care funding, that any kind of state-based uh, program which provides material health care relief to people uh, now, whether that's in the form of a state-based single-payer bill or a state-based primary care bill, or even like a Medicaid grant for a community health care center, um, makes a lot of sense. Um, but by and large, I do not think that um, um, state-based bills are the viable path forward. When someone like Pelosi says that states should be the place where single payer is, is, is experimented with, they should be the laboratories, uh, what they are doing is they're abdicating their responsibility to really face capital and square up against it. Because they're looking for another Vermont or another Colorado or another California to point at and say, doesn't work there, therefore it can't work in the US, even though these two things are about as similar as a dog and a giraffe. Uh, uh, they're not the same kind of animal whatsoever. I think the one thousand we can take away from places like Vermont is that um, uh, massive pressure must be applied to politicians to make them more afraid of their constituents than they are of their donor class. Um, I think that's pretty intrinsic in any, any, any kind of broad popular movement. Um, and I believe that if you scare a local politician, you also can scare a national politician. And so these things fit within each other, like a nice little matryoshka. All right. Um. So I'm going to ask you guys one more fairly quick question, and then we're going to go to questions. So everybody think about your questions, and how are we going to take questions? Is there a mic? So right in this aisle here. Um, and no matter what order people line up in, I'm taking progressive stack from that line. Um, so, um, okay, so I, w I want you guys to address quickly, um, in New York specifically or, or nationally, if you, if you wanna make a point there, we all talked about the sorts of coalitions that are coming together around single payer, um, the need for the people most affected to be at the forefront of this movement, the fact that within the labor movement itself, there's a great deal of variation in terms of commitment to single payer and so forth, and this is going to require a pretty massive coalition if we're going to confront the forces that we've all been discussing up here today. So in terms of building bridges or bringing new constituencies or organizations into the fight for single payer, can you each talk about one um, that you are most interested in, think is most crucial for the year ahead? One bridge to a new constituency, one organization, one new relationship, um, that is going to be important to this coalition that has not been really brought into that fold yet. Um, so I will, anyone who would like to start can start with that question. Well, Go for it. Th this is kind of a wonky thing, but I think in a place like New York, it's really important. We've been working trying to reach out to labor unions that have substantial, what are called Taft and Hart Taft-Hartley Health and Welfare Funds. Uh, these are unions uh, that 
traditionally have been fairly conservative around healthcare policy because they've created these internal uh, funds that, you know, provide, in general, provide really good working class healthcare benefits. Uh, and they have these institutional prerogatives that want to drive their preservation and continuation. We think that in a state like New York, which has a very high union density and very high union uh, involvement and control in Democratic Party politics, that if a couple of large unions with funds like this decided that this was not in their best interest and the best interest of their members, they could kill a New York State bill. You know, they could pull a couple of progressive Democratic senators, you know, away from voting uh, in favor of this bill. And so we think that it's really, this is a crucial time to reach out to those constituencies to talk about the real concerns that they actually have about how these bills play into the the way that they provide health care for their members uh, and to, you know, win over some internal support within that community to legitimize uh, this project and then also try to neutralize some of the, uh, some of the opposition. So, um, you know, this might not be the sort of romantic, you know, proletarian uh, contact in the North Country, but I think in the, in the way New York politics plays out that this is a crucial part of the project. That's very helpful. Um, I, I think, uh, like I said earlier, I think concrete relationships with um, racial justice movements um, is really key. Um, and I think like my um, fellow panelists have mentioned, um, racial justice in healthcare is not just about, um, about gaining access, like equal access to the healthcare system. Um, that's only the first step. Uh, having um, having you know healthcare justice would really, uh, or rather, having a single payer system, <coughs> excuse me, would um, would really change. Uh, I think a lot of people's lives um, in so many other ways that our society is um, is racialized. I mean, for example, I, I think the people's interaction with the criminal justice system would change if um, not entirely, but in some part, if single payer um, was you know, was an issue, was a viable thing in our lives. Um, so yeah, I think, I think alliances with um, racial justice movements. Cool. I'm trying to figure out which answer I want to give the most. Um, I would say one that has been severely neglected is people handling the fallout of the opioid epidemic, right? We know that it'll cost $91 billion to like kind of smooth over to make uh, 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 to, to, I guess, stop the, to, to halt the, 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 the spread and the, the devastation of the opioid epidemic. We also know that the opioid epidemic is the kind of problem that we ignore because only criminals are addicted to opioids. And criminals don't deserve access to legal protections for healthcare or healthcare extension rights, right? Um, you can't find an NGO or a nonprofit anywhere in the U.S. that will accept free money to organize around providing legal protections uh, in healthcare for, for, for people that are in the system. And this affects uh, jillions of people. I mean, it, 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 I can't, like, everybody understands that they're being super fucked over uh, 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 in, in the, like, the epicenter in the area around the, the opioid epidemic, right? Like, I have an example. It's kind of long. I'm sorry. Um, I visited uh, Scott County, um, Indiana. I don't know if you guys know Scott County. It's uh, one of the first places, one of the only places where we saw on the population level a significant increase in cases of HIV AIDS um, year over year. Uh, Scott County, um, a couple of things happened that led to Scott County, and I think that kind of touches on why I think this is a community that uh, needs to be brought into uh, the fight. We must go to them. A um, couple of things happened in Scott County that, uh, to, to compel this. One, uh, Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical company uh, in Indiana that creates the opioid of choice uh, uh, in Scott County, wanted to preserve patent on its drug. And just like what Purdue did with MS Cotton and OxyContin in the 90s, uh, uh, Eli Lilly wanted to make their drug new and improved to maintain patent over it for another decade. And so what they did is they made their opioid no longer crushable to make it tamper resistant. Now, of course, if someone's battling addiction, uh, making a drug no longer crushable doesn't stop them from using that drug. They just dissolve it in water or in, and inject it. Or they turn to heroin. Or they turn to fentanyl. So that happens. At the same time, then Governor Mike Pence uh, shuts down all the state needle exchange programs in Indiana because needle exchange programs are only used by criminals and why are we spending money on criminal health care? 
Also at the same time, the State Executive Board of Health and the state led shut down a bunch of federally qualified uh, Medicaid centers and uh, uh, community health centers like Planned Parenthood where people went to go get care. So all of a sudden people that were uh, 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 battling with addiction, battling with uh, uh, this particular opioid, no longer can crush it, they now have to inject it, there's nowhere to get clean needles and there's nowhere to get care. So what happens, within a couple of years you see a massive increase in cases of, hepat uh, 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 of, of hepatitis B and HIV AIDS and other kinds of diseases that are passed uh, by not having access to safe needles. And so of course, because only criminals have these diseases, they go to jail. Secondly, Ska, uh, Indiana has a pretty robust school voucher, school choice program. So everybody in Scott County who is, in Scott County you've got a bunch of families that are the necropolity, right? They're the walking dead, they don't count. The people that are in the system are just, are, are, are transit between uh, the, in, the institution uh, and, and home. And so families that don't suffer from this, that aren't battling this, don't want their kids to go to school with the kids of criminals, so they send their kids out of county. And they send their, uh, uh, their tax money out of county along with them. Uh, and so all of a sudden you've got a school district in Scott County that's poorer and poorer and serves a greater and greater percentage of its population as kids who are just fucking dealing with shit back home. Families that have been condemned uh, uh, by, their, by their electeds. And so they got their breakfast programs, of course they got their music programs, and they got their guidance counselor and mental health programs. And so I spoke to uh, 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 this really earnest, super overwhelmed, like 24-year-old kid who was the guidance counselor, the remaining guidance counselor in Scott County. And this sounds kind of pornographic, and I'm sorry for being exploited if, 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 it's, if it's a lot. But like he was like, he could look at a kid from a mile away and say, that kid's going through shit. Like they go home and they don't, have, they don't have a parent, and they come to school and we don't have anything to give them. And it led to a significant increase year over year in child suicides. This is the cost. This, this, this is the war that is being fought. These are the people whose bodies are being turned into blood when they cannot be turned into profit. Um, I need to end this anecdote. Um, <laughs> These are the people who are not recognized in any kind of movement um, because their healthcare needs are not expressed, are not articulated, and are not pa uh, part of our vision. I think uh, 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 they are the people that are um, vulnerable among a bunch of people that are vulnerable and that uh, um, give them the chance to be respected and given dignity and they will fight with us for a single pair. All right, sorry. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally fine. Um, those are three pretty powerful answers, I think. Um, and so now we would like to get questions in. Um, so if you guys want to come up to <coughs> behind the camera right here, is that right? Yeah. Uh, ben will set you up with a mic, or someone will? Yeah, OK, great. And let's go ahead and get started. So I would like, oh, hi, I'm Miriam. Um, I would like to be very practical for a minute. I, we have connections in New York DSA with Black Lives Matter. So there are concrete things we could try to do there. I'm not sure what all our other um, things are. I don't know that much about the opioid problem in New York. I think it isn't as terrible. I don't know whether any of it's close. But I am looking at you know what our goals should be. Like I know that when I called my Grace Meng, my congresswoman from Central Queens, and said, this was, I don't know, somewhere six months ago, and I said, thank you for voting against whatever it was that they were trying to do to Planned Parenthood at that point, and are you gonna sign the, Congre the Conyers bill? The staff and didn't know what that was. So I don't have a good sense of whether we know who needs to be pressured and how we should be best doing that here in New York. Great question. Well, uh, I'm going to defer to Runa on some of the politics, but you know, certainly when you talk about, especially New York City, the crisis in the public hospital system, I think, is a crucial uh, organizing nexus. And, you know, it brings together all of these issues about economic uh, and racial disparities and uh, public health care. Um, and then, you know, I think that you need to educate this congressperson from Central Queens who claims they never heard of HR 676 and, you know, force those staffers to read the damn thing. I think that's just, you know, that's pretty outrageous that, you know, a Democratic congressperson from New York City could claim ignorance around Medicare for all. And I think 
should let them know that their constituents are outraged that they have so such indifference to the health care problem that uh, they're not even engaging with this crucial issue. And I, you know, I think this is a time to raise that kind of temperature when you were dealing with, you know, even our so-called friends in the political establishment. So, Runa, maybe you can be more specific about the New York challenges right now. Um, I mean, that's a tough and important question. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer it in a few seconds here. Um, but I think it would require a strategy session within the movement, you know, thinking about, um, you know, who, who our targets are. If, I mean, if you're thinking about at the state level, um, who our allies are, and then what our tactics are and, and how to deploy those tactics. Um, yeah, so I don't think I can give you like a short, clear, what do I do right now, aside from all the things we've talked about today. And I know we have DSA organizers here who have been working on single payer in New York. Do we have resources around who to call, who our targets are, who to be in touch with? Yeah, maybe Chief, you wanna talk about that? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Chi. I'm the campaign coordinator for the Socialist Feminist Working Group. So we've been canvassing um, almost all year for the New York Health Act. And um, first we were targeting Senator Marty Golden in Bay Ridge, who has not signed on in support of um, this bill. Uh, right now we're doing a kind of community-based canvassing program focused on building a base for single-payer health care in the neighborhood of Sunset Park. So I highly encourage all of you to join us in canvassing for this bill. We're gonna be out in the field again this Sunday, November 19th at 1 p.m. And if you're interested, um, you can sign up after the event. Um, I'm sorry, what was the, I don't know if I addressed the question. Yeah, you, you did. I think the question was around who we should be targeting and so forth. Um, so yeah, Marty Golden is one good target. Um, I think it would also, well, this is kind of a really difficult target, but Simka Felder is another target. He is a state senator in various neighborhoods in South Brooklyn. He is also not signed on in support of this bill. Also targeting the IDC is very important. Um, does everyone know or understand what the IDC is? So the IDC is a group of um, Democratic senators, Democratic state senators that Despite being Democrats, they um, caucus with Republicans on various progressive laws, and they're kind of the big reason why New York State has not been able to pass a lot of progressive legislation. So this is, this is five senators. So putting pressure on them in 2018 is also gonna be very important. Um, so Jesse Hamilton, these senators are Jesse Hamilton, um, Marisol Alcantara, don't remember the other three. Joseph Klein. The, the IDC, um, like just in the last year, I think has like has come around to supporting um, the New York Health Act after a lot of pressure. And um, I mean, I don't think that's any reason to not continue pressuring them. <laughs> but just as an FYI, how things have changed in the last just in the last year. <laughs> Excuse me. Simka Felder is. The, the lone Democrat that, um, that doesn't support um, the bill. So that's a, an obvious place to apply pressure, but yeah. yeah. And so Chi, I take it people should come up to that table over there if they wanna get involved in putting pressure on people in New York State? Yes, I highly encourage you all to join us in canvassing. Um, it's a great way to get involved with the fight for universal health care in New York. You don't need any canvassing experience, so if you're new to this fight, this is a great way to get involved. I highly encourage you all to um, come and join us. Awesome, thanks. Um, do we have another question? It looks like we do. Yeah, and if people can get up more than one at a time if you want. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, hey. I'm wondering if there's, uh, what exists in terms of city single payer? as uh, like a, a policy innovation or an option that has been played around with, experimented with. Um, in part, New York 
and California under this umbrella of sanctuary and sanctuary cities. Since states have historically been the level at which experimentation happens, you were talking about incubator or laboratories, how, what, what potential is there at the city level in terms of narrative, policy, legislation, and what are the limitations? Two things, pretty quick, and I'll actually be quick this time. Um, one, uh, two opportunities for that I, I think are interesting. One, New York City gives a bunch of free funding and free advertising to the makers of Truvada, which is the prophylactic drug for um, HIV AIDS, but they have negotiated no lower prices for that, so all of a sudden you've got an expensive drug that is born in the Medicaid population with no, like, we're giving a, we're giving a bunch getting none back. Uh, I don't think a city has ever tried to negotiate drug prices on the citywide level. That'd be pretty interesting. And we already have, like, the, like hooks uh, in, in the maker of that drug. Two, one of the things that was in a policy platform for a guy that ran for city council in Seattle that I thought was interesting was funding a bunch of, uh, like, a, a, a call center of social workers. We understand that, like, uh, uh, like, a lot of the reasons that care gets really expensive and then is borne by the state or city populations is because folks don't have access to early care, preventive care, primary care, screenings. And so providing a, 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 a and care is not just clinical, but, uh, uh, you know, access to finding out how to talk to a lawyer to sue your slumlord, access to uh, find out where food is available near you. Um, and so robust staffing of social worker call centers is affordable on the city level. Um, and does a whole lot to help with the kind of social determinants or rather like the non-clinical side of care for people that are in need. It's not satisfactory, it's not enough, but a city can afford it, a city can do it, and it's like a pretty like, like when we have a more uh, 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 just uh, 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 health state, like that must be part of it, why not start it at the city level and, and provide that model? Yeah, um, I think, so the the senator who uh, used to be the co-sponsor with um, Dick Godfrey at the state level, whose name is escaping me right now, he Rivera. no Rivera is the current one. Um, he the previous one stepped down from his state senate position in the last year and to, and um, won a city council position. Um, and part of his and he's been a champion of the New York Health Act for many years. Um, part of his um, uh, agenda is to pass a city resolution. So, you know, I think that falls in the realm of resolutionary politics. Um, I think it would be significant uh, for the city council to pass a resolution, um, you know, in support of the New York Health Act. Uh, I haven't heard of any city level um, insurance systems. I think, I don't know, I mean, I think it would be very complicated um, to set up like a, a city wide insurance system. I mean, especially because so much is done either like state or federally, but. It's an interesting, interesting thought. I'll, I'll definitely think about it. it. Just briefly, I want to remind folks of what New York City used to be like. I went to <laughs> City College at a time when it was free, and my first two babies were cared for in North Central Bronx Hospital virtually for free. Um, there was, I don't know, $5 co-pays in a very, very uh, excellent uh, clinic clinical environment. So, you know, cities... They can't address the entire problem of healthcare financing and delivery, but you know it's certainly a terrain of struggle to struggle for uh, expansion of public health care programs. San Francisco has a pretty innovative primary care clinical uh, program for uninsured people. Seattle's experimenting with some of these things. So I think that it's certainly it's a legitimate area to, to fight for as we move forward, uh, to expand wherever possible to fight for the principle of, of the public provision of health care as a basic human right. Uh, so I think that's important. And sorry, that does remind me, Mark alluded to this earlier, um, the City uh, Health and Hospitals Corporation is in a gigantic deficit. Um, and you know it's like a $2 billion deficit or something like that. And this is clearly the result of, um, of the two-tier privately profit-driven health system. So I think if there was going to be city-level um, organizing going on, it would be about supporting the public hospital system. And I think that goes hand in hand with really um, tearing down the, um, the profit-driven uh, private health insurance industry. So I think that would be sort of the, and there is amazing organizing happening um, led largely by, by unions in the city on that issue. Yeah, next. 
Hi, my name is Miriam Callahan. I am currently a medical student, a member of DSA and Students for a National Health Program. Um, I'm wondering about organizing in communities or in spaces that might be, um, might have stated ideals that are for expanding care and single payer, um, but whose financial interests might be counter to that. I'm thinking of like huge health systems like NYP or um, hospital systems elsewhere in the state or the country um, and the AMA? Um, so th those are good questions. So it sounds like how to deal with liberalism in, <laughs> uh, in institutions that are financially, you know, their interests are with big money and not with um, the public's health. So, I mean, I think particularly as a student, but also workers in these institutions in the city, I mean, there's thousands of, of workers and students who work in the hospital systems in the city that are majority um, private. Those, I mean, as I showed you in those like crazy uh, images earlier, the majority of the, um, the hospital systems in the city are um, very much financially and personally tied up with the profit motive and the, you know, the insurance industry, et cetera. I think that um, workers and students in these institutions can organize and exert a lot of moral pressure um, on their institutions. Um, students have a particular voice. Um, they are, you know, um, they're relatively free and can, um, can, can really exert a lot of pressure. Uh, I have a vision um, of you know single payer committees happening in every hospital um, and clinic in the in the city. I mean in the state, I think that would be a really amazing way to organize both to um, raise consciousness among healthcare workers um, and students about um, how our um, how the the ethics of providing healthcare um, is deeply compromised by working in a for-profit healthcare system that we all work in. Even if you work in the the public hospital system um, or in any kind of public clinic, um, it's still deeply compromised by the profit-driven model. Um, so that was your first question. The second question was about the AMA. The AMA is um, only represents like 17% of doctors. Um, the the majority of doctors. This is changing over the last year. Um, actually support single payer now, which is a really significant change and I think really reflects um, the increasing frustration with the healthcare system. Doctors are historically a very conservative group. Um, you know, they're uh, known for putting up resistance to Medicare in the 60s. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress too much about the AMA. I would just out-organize them. Um, you know, that being said, I think that, you know, there's, ev there's, um, there's different medical societies in every state and in the country. Um, and I think it's important to, uh, to propose resolutions, you know, in those bodies to support single payer. And there, that, has, that is being done by, um, by uh, you know, people in those societies, both students and professionals. So, for example, in New York State, the New York State um, Academy of Family Practice, there's, for every specialty within medicine, there's one of these academies. And it's a, it's a good place to, you know, to, to voice the, the need for single payer. I, you know, I don't think the physicians' organizations are going to be the revolutionary vanguard. Um, but it's very important to, um, to, to really make known that, that doctors and other healthcare workers really do support single payer. Because, um, like Mark was saying, the um, industry is going to start a, uh, a really insane campaign um, fear-mongering, and they're going to say things like doctors will leave the state, they won't, um, you know, I don't know, they're going to come up with all kinds of crazy things like they don't want this, um, I, I can't even think of them, but so, you know, and we, so Thank we're you. actually at the campaign for New York Health, we're, um, we're doing this, uh, this petition right now to get 10,000 doctors um, in the state to, and medical students actually, to support, um, to support the bill, to come out and say that they support it. Um, and that is primarily because we are trying to anticipate the um, and inoculate against the um, industry um, campaigns. I have one framework and one tool I found in organizing, particularly students' financial health programs. One framework, it's uh, financial toxicity. It's a legal framework advanced by Isaac Buck down in University of Tennessee. It's the idea that um, uh, debt is a side effect, that is a condition, and just like a, uh, how a physician or a provider would not want to give somebody a drug that might make them more sick without, without, that, without the permission, um, giving somebody a, 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 a drug or a treatment that puts them in medical debt uh, is a side effect. A good example of that is Zaltrap, which was the really expensive cancer drug that came out in 2011 that cost like a million dollars for a course of treatment. A bunch of doctors at, I think it was 
uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering went out and said, we're not going to fucking prescribe this. It's incrementally better, but it puts our patients hugely in debt. We cannot do this to them. This, like, per this you are coercing us to harm our patients by, by, by making costs too high. If you explore that theme further of being coerced to harm your patients by putting them into debt, the natural uh, uh, end result is a single-payer model, which I found effective uh, in, in talking to organ uh, in, in to physicians and, and, and med students. Secondly, I think a parallel demand that goes under the, uh, like, uh, alongside single-payer uh, in the arc of health justice is free or tuition relief programs for all medical practitioners. It is unjust to live in a world in which only the, like children of doctors can afford to become doctors themselves. Um, right now, m most rural uh, primary care providers are in J1 visas because uh, you cannot afford to get trained domestically and then go work in rural medicine. I think the, like these two, like the, this framework of we are being forced to harm our patients and also like we are perpetuating stomach violence but only like, like, people become doctors uh, 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 lead naturally to a what you want in an uh, in organization, and I found that helpful in other places. We maintain that any time there's a substantial social reform that affects the livelihoods of uh, ordinary working people, that there needs to be a just transition uh, included in those reforms to uh, uh, ensure that they're not paying the price for those reforms. And there are a lot of just straight, normal working people who will be affected by the transition to a single payer system. And uh, you know, we call for real transitional benefits for those folks, not just lip service, but real, real commitments to income support, uh, job retraining, reallocation, early retirement benefits, respect for union organization. Uh, we uh, worked with Senator Sanders to include uh, uh, real money in his bill, 1% uh, of the national health budget for five years would go to just, just transition. That's something in the area of $30 billion a year, so that's real money uh, for working people that we can begin to think about allocating. And it's important to do that. I mean, a New York progressive, who I will remain nameless, um, you know, one of his objections to single payer was, what are you going to do? when 500 African-American women who work for Blue Cross pick it up in Albany saying they're going to lose their job because of single payer. And, you know, we have to be prepared for those kind of realities because those women need to know that there will be uh, uh, a role for them in this, in this new system or else they will become our enemies. The New York Health Act does have some just transition language in it. There's retraining programs, um, job retraining programs. I don't know the details, but I'm going to learn more about it. Yeah. Yeah, insurance companies predominantly. Yeah. I'm just going to slide in there because I want to do another turn. Um, a, in order to reduce costs long term, you must invest in upfront social work and upfront uh, patient advocacy groups. If you have the, the skill set required to adjudicate a claim, you have the skill set, which is a way of denying somebody that you are that you're taking care of coverage. You have the same skill set required to find somebody more opportunities for care. If you offer somebody who works in the insurance industry like their same kind of job, but respond to help their community, they will take it. I know that because I work in insurance, but my employer does not know I'm here. Uh, um, like the, there is a there is a massive skill set that is transferable to a more just state. We must create these jobs in order to make this thing durable. Uh, 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 I think we articulate that ahead of time. That's good. Be good. Yeah, and I'm glad you all brought that up as well because I've already seen the articles coming out that say, you know, uh, you know, is healthcare reform of any kind going to have sort of what we think of as like the coal miner problem, right? Getting rid of something that's bad also puts working people out of work. Um, and we have to think about how we're grappling with that. The Connors bill also has language. Um, it is important when people say that to point out that that language has been incorporated into all of these bills. And making that a reality is, of course, something we have to think carefully about and in detail. But that is not neglected by any of these bills. Um, so we only have a little time left. So what I want to do is the people who are currently standing up in line, are there three of you? Is that correct? Um, each of you, if each of you could ask your question, we're gonna take them as a group, and then the yeah, folks up here can sort of pick and choose and answer what you wanna answer. Um, do we have the mic? <laughs> we do have the mic, okay. Let's do it. Hi, um, I'm Evan. Uh, my question is essentially, you know, since 
uh, for this campaign, you necessarily have to work with uh, sort of establishment political actors. Oh, can, can you hear me all right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Democratic Party politicians and both working with them and lobbying them and trying to pressure them to do different things. How do we make sure that sort of a independent socialist uh, politics uh, stays in command and that we are able to use this also to build said politics? Hi, again, I'm Christy. I'm trained as a social worker and work in the mental health field. Um, I want to jump off the question earlier about liberalism in the industry, not just from those uh, with vested interests in um, uh, maintaining this industry, but also um, how liberalism is deeply in the training and ideology of social workers, nurses, mental health professionals, hospital, hospital staff, and home health aides, a lot of whom I work with. Um, uh, I want to expand a little bit more on this claim of Tim's um, that I think is great. The health justice is and involves environmental justice and economic, racial, gender justice as well. Um, uh, to ask that, you know, we see that um, not only access but also the mode of care is affected by the structure and fun functioning of the current system. Um, I want to ask where do you see people thinking about or organizing or experimenting around this horizon that is the mode? or form of care and not just access to it. Hello, my name is Khalil. Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the transition because despite the fact that over in California, there were hurdles with the bill dying in the legislature, Jerry Brown, despite his previous support for it, um, spoke that he was uh, skeptical about uh, signing off on the bill Cuomo is even more to the right, and there's not an insubstantial risk of him vetoing, even if we get the New York Health Act through the state legislature. So what's, what work is being done to organize budget committees to develop fiscal policy to make sure the New York Health Act is fully funded to make sure that there's not a high risk of a veto from Governor Cuomo? Thank you. Um, so we have this question of sort of dealing with the establishment while keeping socialism out front. We have the question of the sort of mode and form of care. Um, and we have a question about uh, funding and fiscal policy in relation to health care and its relation to the vetoes of uh, somewhat conservative Democratic governors. Um, so let's jump into that kind of wherever you guys want to start. Um, Someone eager to jump in? Mark, you look like you're ready to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, these are all really great, uh, great questions. Um, you know, look, the problem with progressive organizing in this country is we always demobilize when we think we're winning and then we lose. And that's uh, um, something that, you know, a self-conscious political organization ought to address and uh, you know, this is a huge opportunity to do so, and I hope that groups like DSA begin to uh, struggle with these issues. I don't think socialists can drive the, the sort of inside politics right now, but they can emerge from this fight, you know, as a coherent uh, and important trend and begin to uh, move forward to both defend this victory and then implement a broader program. Uh, so, you know, this is a real opportunity to begin to define what a socialist politics looks like inside this really fucked up two-party winner-take-all system that we have, whether there's some escape hatches that we can use to build real working-class politics or whether, you know, we can uh, play with sort of this inside-outside strategies that people have been talking about uh, to build working-class power. But this is a huge uh, opportunity to do, do this, and it's organizations like DSA that I really need to begin to think through this stuff and experiment and try new uh, new approaches. Um, the sort of mode of care issue, I think that there's there's people looking at it. You know, I, I think that there's some international places to look at. I think you know Cuba, for example, is very interesting. They have a completely uh, upside down view of how you provide health from people. It starts in the community and then kind of moves up to the sort of tertiary care, whereas in this country, you know, we start at these gigantic industrial healthcare complexes at the top and then everything sort of exists to move people into that relationship. So I think there's modes out there. Um, it's hard to think about them in the U.S. because of the way profit dictates healthcare. Uh, and then, you know, the 
the, the struggles with the sort of democratic establishment that uh, Cleo talked about. I think that's the central challenge that we have in places like New York and California. Uh, and, you know, I think again, that goes back to what socialist politics is all about in that context. Can, um, the person who asked about mode of care, can you just clarify what you mean by mode of care? Um, so in the mental health field, um, cutting behavioral therapy is generally considered the treatment of choice for like, most people for like anything. And a, a lot of the reason for this is that it puts the onus on the individual and it, and it reinforces this narrative of like uh, pull oneself up, up by one's traps and it really um, just further adventures a lot of the like, people ideology. There are other uh, like psychoanalytic, um, for example, um, modes that So you're wondering, like, how a change in our in the funding structure might change the practice of yeah, healthcare? I think making people think more about um, the individuals that they're treating as a part of the social collective, and not as mm. individuals. I mean, that's a great question, and um, I wish I had the chance to work with more um, clinicians who thought about this and had time to think about this kind of thing. Um, certainly, like you're kind of alluding to the fact that the healthcare system as it currently is um, very much atomizes and individualizes people. Um, even I'm trained in family practice, um, and historically the field of family practice started in the late 60s um, in response to a lot of progressive movements. Um, and, uh, you know, historically in family practice there used to be um, family charts um, where the, the whole family was put into one folder. Um, and you know that that does that can have some problems, but one of the interesting things about it is that um, it does see individuals in the context of um, their social environment, and you know in that case the biological family. Um, and, and now you know that I learned about that sort of as a relic in medical school, but we don't use it anymore, and it's because of the medical record. Each person is just a unit. You see them, you know, for 15 minutes. Um, or 20 if you're lucky, um, and you know you just kind of deal with them in this very brief moment. So anyway, um, you know I think the the healthcare system now, the profit-driven motive, definitely selects for a very like biomedically focused kind of um, care, and um, and I think that if we did have a single payer system, the the ethic of it could change to be more public health oriented. Um, and that, I would hope, would really open up space for people, clinicians, to first of all, direct what kind of care we have, because right now all of the decisions about what kind of care we provide is really driven by, um, by business people, you know? Um, even in my last job, um, I wanted to do like more group visits, for example, and there's really not much space to do that kind of thing, um, because it's really about the number of people you see um, and the pressure for volume, um, and by which I mean like the number of people you see, is the only thing that, um, that really matters. And the kind of care you provide um, and the creativity that you could bring to it, as well as like all of the clinical training you have, um, really is secondary to this like harsh pressure for seeing numbers of people and what ends up being in like the most superficial way possible in order to bill. Um, so, yeah, I would love to talk more about, like, interesting ideas, creative ideas you have for care. Cool. I'll hop on to the modes question as well. So, unfortunately, I don't know uh, the answer to Khalil's question about um, how do we prevent Cuomo from vetoing this. Um, I'd be happy to find out if anyone else knows that. I would love to learn, but I'm afraid I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can talk about mode, uh, mode of care. We see this being explored in a couple of places, most prominently is Medicaid, right? Medicaid, Medicaid frequent utilizers are the same, fall into the same kind of streams as a, 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 a prison frequent utilizers. It's people that go to jail for the crime of being homeless in a, a hospital and inpatient where people go to the hospital because they have nowhere else to go. It's with primary good care. So Medicaid has had to build all these kind of peripheral things to attempt to address the whole person because otherwise they will go bankrupt because inpatient costs uh, much more than anything else. You've got things like the Strong Start program, which is a whole person like um, um, prenatal uh, program, uh, taking care of a pregnant person like up until they give birth and then six weeks afterward, that's when a person stops being important to Medicaid. Um, mm -hmm. 
But like that, that's a whole lot of like really integrated care. I know a social worker who works at Strong Start, and her job is just to call clinics elsewhere in the state when she works and find folks all the kinds of different care they need. Um, that's a great model, and it's, of course its primary problem is resource constraints. Uh, along with what Vruna was saying, one of the things that a payer does in this process is one, it is forced to spend more on the upfront care to kind of bend the cost curve, which is the phrase, from 5% of folks driving half of all costs to a broader, more equitable dis distribution, which gives us broader like um, structural reforms and kind of a, a broader base of how to spend and allocate money. One of the things that we see is that the payment model by which a physician is reimbursed drives the kind of care that they give. Diagnosed, uh, a DRG, diagnosis really groups uh, based care, pay somebody to achieve a diagnosis. In things like primary care and in mental care, the time spent not getting a diagnosis is uh, essential to the process, right? Um, and like it's this like rush to achieve diagnosis and, and then push off that leads to one, a consolidation of like how often do you get to see a patient. If your goal is to be a diagnosis factory, you want as little time as possible per patient because you want to get like the incremental like 20 bucks per diagnosis or whatever, even though often like some patients need more than 10 minutes to get on the bed in the first place. Uh, also, diagnosis-driven care pushes people into uh, uh, very easily diagnosable forms of mental health. So like, tank, like, there's no profit. If you don't get paid until you get a diagnosis, any, any work until you get a diagnosis is like bonus time that you're not getting paid for. Shifting to capitation rates, which is you pay per person, um, or other kinds of longer-term care models is a way to help physicians not be incentivized to uh, treat patients poorly, but it is not enough. Um, it is, a, however, like one of the tools at the disposal of the payer. And if the payer is forced to deal with the costs of people not getting care, it is thus incentivized to begin exploring alternative payment models. I'm not going to ramble for evidence, but you see an example of that. If you look up what happened in the Maryland, uh, Appalachian, Maryland uh, a Medicaid program, where you had a de facto single payer, because Appalachian, Maryland, everybody's a Medicaid, um, they had to force a hospital to move to a cap. Oh, they just said, we're going to pay you a capitation now. And then the hospital began building uh, rural and primary care to prevent people from getting uh, going inpatient to, to get an intensive surgeries, and that led to better outcomes and more time per patient. So like, a lot of the things that the payer can do can force or coerce or incentivize or dangle a carrot in front of a provider to make better choices. That kind of I get to talk about? Sweet. Awesome. So I want to thank our tremendous panelists up here for their incredible contributions to our understanding of single payer today. Um, it's also a sign of the time that so many people are here to talk about single payer on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and I would encourage everybody who's interested in working on this issue to sign up at the table over there. You can also talk to some of the organizers working on single payer in New York. And a big hand for our panelists.